evening, good morning, wherever you are. A um, few words um, for those that don't know about Earthbeat and the Human Potential series. So Earthbeat is um, Earthbeat started as a festival um, dedicated to um, celebration and transformation. Uh, with focus on a new way of living. Uh, the festival this year was about to go on on, the, on March, and it was stopped by the COVID four days before. And it was, uh, it was a big shock for all of us. Um, but then we, we decided to just start and, you know, still keep connection with all our followers and still keep our uh, talents and uh, and our offering to the to to our community and one of those projects is this human um, potential series with the, with the first part talking about how to transform uh, uncertainty into action um, so this is this is how we how we come about, and I'm really happy to to have uh, Jamie Cato Cato uh, here on the call. I know of his work since uh, something like I think it was 2002 when One Giant Leap, the movie, the documentary came out, and and. Uh, I just loved it. I watched it so many times because like every time that I watched it, I, I just found more and more inspiring um, uh, parts and the music is awesome. Um, and then about, I think like 10 years later was the uh, What About Me, the second uh, documentary. And one thing that I found about those videos about those documentaries that most documentaries has like an idea that they try to to kind of convince or to to pass through but those documentaries that like join this music and and interviews and visual was more of an inquiry and what i did what i liked a lot was that you you weren't afraid to give voice to some opinions that were quite sometimes really annoying, like like really like press buttons, but you, like but you gave them the space. So this is like I think like ten, about almost like ten years since um, what about me? So we again now going through a new giant leap, and. Yeah, I was talking about that um, the idea of looking at those voices that we don't like to hear as a, as a segue to to our conversation. I think that like there is something there that um, that we can look at and and learn. So if you would like to, yeah, share with us your ideas about it about the voices we don't like to hear. Yeah. Well, that's a central part of my passion at the moment is most people, we all have crazy characters in our heads. We all have a victim. We all have a suffering scarcity beggar. We all have a critic and a slave driver and all these, what we usually try to escape our fear and our grief and the less comfortable things. And our culture is so based on comfort addiction, it seems very counterintuitive to turn towards those things and scary. Mm. But um, we're not in the practice of trying to get rid of things. The only way to really heal and transform is to turn towards, not just to turn towards, but to turn towards with welcome and love and curiosity and, um, become a wine taster of those feelings, be so, so willing. And when you do that, these things which we thought were great phantoms 
were so scary, were so impossible, because the, we've built them up in our mind by always looking in the opposite direction, that they've, in our imagination, become huge, and in our many, many years of avoiding them. But really, when you turn towards them, you realize they're, they're not dragons. They are children's chalk drawings of dragons. And a little curiosity and love, and they just transform. And they don't just vanish. It's not just about, again, trying to get rid of them or neutralize pain. They actually turn into treasure. They turn into illumination. They turn into creativity, sexuality, gifts. And so behind these ideas of fear, there's an alchemy possible where they actually turn into we always say in my workshop, Transforming Shadows, the line we call it is, turn your demons, <clears throat> turn your demons into employees. Mm. All of these parts of ourselves, these voices, these negative things we're trying to escape, they are really bodyguards. They're really helpers, which are working from old data we gave them when we were children because we were immature. So we said, never let me feel this, never let me feel that. So they're working from old orders we gave them. But when we bring them into 2020 and give them love and thank them for their help or thank them for trying to help us and ask them now, what do they want to do now that we're safer and we're an adult? They don't just neutralize the chaos and the pain. They actually give us their gifts. So it's all a practice of turning towards not escaping, not rejecting, not suppressing. Hmm. And, and you said, I, I read a few of your blogs, and you were talking about um, how everything that we see in the world, everything that we kind of trying to fight, it's actually an arrow that points into ourselves. And, and I think that like in this time, in, when there is so much fear with... Um, uh, all those, uh, uh, our, you know, we cannot travel anymore as much. We, our, um, all those theories that, that coming out, like all those people that are trying to control, like there was a lot of fear, a lot of unknown, unknown. And like, so we, um, how you would use that idea to face, um, yeah, those, those demons out there. Sometimes these fears are because before it was easy to, in our comfort, it was easy just to ignore what was already there. So many of the things people are fearing or realizing they're not new the realization is new but the controls the lack of compassion with which the wealthy people have been controlling the people um, was always there but sometimes when we ignore something and ignore something and ignore something so long the universe has to make it so obvious so you can't ignore it anymore. And every single one of us plays our part in perpetuating the system which is not fair, which is violent. We all fill our cars up in a petrol station and nearly every petrol station uses oil from Saudi Arabia and it's a place where women's rights are like medieval you know like in the dark ages but still we all buy the petrol from them and give us give them our money many people still eat meat where there is a daily holocaust going on for sentient feeling creatures there's 175 factory farms just in Britain, which are the size of football stadiums. 
daily doing a holocaust of feeling creatures just so that everyone can have cheap ham sandwiches or sausage and chips. Every time you order meat in a restaurant that doesn't say organic, blah, 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 you're giving money to those people. And a million other things. So it is good that we are having these revealing things that we cannot ignore anymore. But the people have to ask themselves, what's more important to have instant meat, you know, instant comfort or instant pleasure and be selfish and add to the ongoing journey of violence and destruction and the planet, just, you know, smartphones, which are, have a battery where children are in the mines of Africa pulling out the coltan. We're all doing it. And the, it's good that it's harder to hide from our own mirror that we can't complain about the government or the, the bad people who are destroying the world. Every time you buy meat, every time you buy a smartphone, every time you fill up your car, you're giving money to those people. I don't know what the solution exactly is, but I think a great first step is to take inner responsibility that we can't point the finger at all the bad people when we ourselves every single day are giving them our money so that we can have an easier, more immediately comfortable and pleasurable life. Mm. So it's, it's like, it's us as like the uh, people that have like, um, yeah, the privilege. We realize that like, you know, we're starting to feel what other, other being and other people feeling like as, as their life. You know, we're so. afraid. Yeah. And, but, and, and this is, this is a big demon, isn't it? It's a, like, it's a big fear that like, that, that sit and, and talking about, you know, this uncertainty, like being, and for me, it's, it's many times about just relaxing with uncertainty, like, like just being there with, with those feelings not trying to change them. How you would, how you would, uh, uh, you know, using your, your kind of your knowledge, you said that it's like it's your passion at the moment, how you help people to transform those demons or those, you know, those demons into, into employees. There are a few things. I mean, it begins with what I just said about turning towards, not running away. Mm -hmm being willing to feel some discomfort. We're so addicted in our culture to always being comfortable. And when we think something happens, when we feel something that might be edgy or uncomfortable, we think something must be wrong, as if we should be in a life that is always comfortable. And it's, it's very strange how, you know, we live in a culture where the TV says, get a headache, take a pill. Whatever's wrong, get rid of it when really these edgy feelings, like the feelings of chaos, the feelings of fear, they're messengers. And if we could just each say, I am a human who is willing to feel some of my uncomfortable feelings, which is a huge step for most people, but a necessary vital step to living a juicy, full life as a human. Life will be full of light and dark. It will be full of pain and pleasure. If I'm constantly trying to edit away the pain and always only take the pleasure like a child, then the dirty dishes next to my sink, they get bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually everything crashes down. All the suppression, suppression, I don't want you to see me angry, I don't want you to see me cry, I don't want you to see me looking stupid, I don't want you to see my fear. Eventually there is a breaking point. The body can only hold so much suppression and denial. But when we're willing to turn towards it, then the body's genius emotional plumbing system can begin to discharge that accumulation of all that suppressed anger that had no permission, all those suppressed tears that had no permission, all that suppressed fear and anxiety. It's all in us, which is why we overreact so much to everything. Because when you upset me, 
I don't just feel the feelings of today of you upsetting me. I feel the suppressed feelings of every idiot that, that treated me that way my whole life that I didn't express. So while the ego is looking for comfort to avoid anybody that upsets me, the soul, which wants to use the emotional plumbing to discharge all that accumulation, what Eckhart Tolle calls the pain body, the soul is looking for idiots. It's looking for adversity to stir it up so that it can be like a laxative. And if I'm brave and I'm willing to feel it instead of always be in avoidance and run to Facebook or run to the fridge or some run to complaint or something else, if I'm willing to be inside myself, which again is a huge step, I am a human who is willing to feel some of my uncomfortable feelings. Huge step. I mean, we're so brainwashed against it. But if I can get there, then when you upset me and I feel that volcano in my chest or I feel that contraction in my heart and I go inside, I go, hello, and I be loving and spacious and curious, then my incredible body's energy system, which I don't have to operate, it does it itself, like my digestion, like everything else, it will recalibrate and discharge that energy for me if I'm willing to feel it and I breathe gently into my heart or whatever I do just to say hello, be curious, be kind, be welcoming. If I just do that when something upsets me, then the charge of my mind, who do, who's wrong? How are they my enemy? Why am I a victim? This is so unfair. I'm going to control. I'm going to get revenge. Da, 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 da. If we can avoid that brain part and stay in the body and we'd be willing to feel that chaos, then the body's genius energy system, which operates by itself without us having to do anything except be present and be willing to feel, it discharges, it recalibrates, and the charge goes down. And then I can speak to you as an adult, not a regressed child. Yeah, and it's interesting. I'm, I'm a therapist in my, in my profession, and one of my uh, in, inspiring people is, is a... Was a uh, um, psychotherapist uh, that his name was Milton Erickson, and he he was a genius in what what we call utilization. He could use anything as a as a leverage to create change. So even what we call the negative, if you if you look at it from the right perspective or you can just like, you know, it's just energy. You know, you can use it as a stepping stone that actually will push you into the right direction. Absolutely. Now, one of the, one of the things that I really like uh, about, you know, looking at, at your workshop, that you use a lot of humor, aren't you? Like how to laugh about it. Yeah, I mean, we make it so serious, our suffering, like we're the only person who's so crazy, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I believe in this alchemy, like I have five questions that I ask when something is difficult. We call them the unpretentiously named five golden keys of alchemy. And uh, the first question we ask when something happens that you don't like or is painful is if I had set up this experience as a training, what was I trying to show myself? Great question. It takes you out of being a victim immediately. If I had set this whole thing up as a training, what might I have been trying to show myself? Great question. The second question we ask is, how is what is happening a reminder for me to self-care in a way that I have forgotten to or neglected to? Usually there's always an answer to that question. Maybe I need more boundaries. Maybe I wasn't honest. Maybe I was, I don't know. How am I supposed to look after myself here? How have I forgotten to self-care? The third question we ask is, how is what is happening an invitation for me to be more honest, show up more, be more visible, maybe more vulnerable? So we ask that question is, mostly when something as difficult is happening, it's an opportunity for us to communicate something that we maybe have been holding back, maybe even to ourselves. The fourth question we ask 
is how does this hurt more because of my painful past? Usually the, the proportion of pain is more than just this experience. So it, it directs us to look at why is it hurting more? What things in the past is this banging against that I haven't really dealt with? And the fifth question, because we are all wounded healers and we use these experiences for being more empathic and helping others, is we ask the question, through all of this, what are the gifts I can share with others? Mm. And when we ask those five questions, alchemy happens. What was shit turns into gold. There's always mm. some illumination, some treasure. There's always a mature experience instead of an immature, escaping, complaining experience. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's interesting. I'm, when, I'm, when I'm working with people, one of the questions that I always ask is like, what will be different in your life once, you know, what bother you is, is not there anymore. And people are, they, they just getting stuck because we are so used to kind of chew on what didn't work. And we kind of, you know, it's like when, when you're missing a tooth and you keep on putting your tongue there, it's like, so we are looking for more reasons instead of just, you know, let it be and move forward and just like starting to envision like our, you know, where we want to go, you know, if we don't want, you know, and so it's, it's interesting because like your question, your question, those questions are really can give that kind of frame that from there you can just start to go forward. Yeah. And their questions, anyone with no training no necessarily spiritual practice. You don't need any of that stuff. Everyday people, you don't need to be meditating or doing yoga or, I mean, those things are all great, but you don't need it to ask those questions. Anyone can ask them. They're just common sense. Mm. Yeah. And uh, tell me, like, one of the things that like, I found uh, quite inspiring is to talk to people like yourself, like thinkers and, and people that actually invested in learning. Because we all go through rough time, right? We go through adversity. We all go, um, we all have low time. And so it's not about not having them or it's, it, it, it's not about what happened so much. It, it's more about how we explain it to ourselves or how we, we tell ourselves yeah like and, and what we do with it mm -hmm. what do you do in, in in you know how you go through time of you know difficult time like what what is your mechanism to be spacious to remember to be yin not yang Normally we're trained when something difficult happens to be yang, to jump into action, to use our will, to control it back to how we want to affect change with our will. The yin part of us is the part that allows, that goes soft, that goes silent, that listens, which is receptive. So we're very trained to go yang and go busy and control immediately to, to we have a religion to eternally preserve the comfort zone. So we don't wait to hear what is the message behind the thing which might threaten that. But if we can dare to wait for one moment, we can pause, which is yin, which if we can stop, which is yin, empty, which is yin, rather than act and listen deeply, then immediately what was a huge battle a dragon turns into an angel sometimes it turns into a voice of wisdom the trick is to be able to stop first to to go past our programming which says act take action make it how you want control it's so hard to, mm. sometimes to when the chemicals of the body which feel resistance which feel fear which feel anger they jump in and make us act. So we need to stay awake. We get spiritual narcolepsy. The moment something happens which we don't like, 
the wise kind Jamie and the wise kind Itai fall asleep and a controlling bodyguard with less mature decisions takes the wheel. So the first trick is to stay awake, not to fall asleep, to notice the resistance, to notice the reaction, to notice the anger, to notice the impulse to control or battle or strategize. Notice it all, but stay awake and go, ah, I'm not giving you decision-making power anymore. I notice you. I notice the urge to control, to protect, to, to escape, but I'm not giving you decision. I'm not giving you the wheel. I'm going to stay awake and I'm going to stop, not act, mm. stop, wait, pause, listen. And it only takes a few minutes. If you can just catch it, then maturity and illumination can happen. But you have to catch it before yeah. you fall asleep. Yeah, it's interesting. Like I learned, um, I learned that lesson uh, many years ago. I was, uh, uh, I was married, and for a few years, and after three years, yeah, I went to Brazil to practice capoeira, and I came back, and in the airport, my wife told me that she wanted a divorce, and it was a huge shock. But then a few days later, she told me, she told me, like, I give you your freedom and you cannot see it at the moment, when, but one day you would look back and you're going to thank me. Now, at the time, I couldn't see it, but a few years later, I went for a big journey that changed my life across Australia on riding a bicycle. I lived all over the world. I, um, yeah, found my voice and, and did a lot of of things that I'm really proud of and, and you know, live my life. Unfortunately, a couple of years later, she passed away from cancer. So every time that I'm going through this kind of time of, you know, difficult time, I have, I'm, you know, I don't say like, oh, it's all for the best because I don't know what will be. But what I do know that I cannot see it at the moment. And one day I will look back and I will go like, ah, okay, you know, that yeah. you know because you know that life will change and like you know that kind of the stop and just relax with not knowing what yeah, will that come was next very helpful funny like when i got divorced mm. about 10 years ago i was very much confused how am i going to pay for two houses now and the kids and how how am I going to live and what am I going to do? It was also the same time the entertainment industry crashed and there was no more budgets for films and albums and what about me wasn't going to be released and it was a big drama. And I was speaking to this cool kind of uh, yoga teacher guy. I think he was Israeli actually, maybe. Anyway, he said to me, um, he said, you know, Jamie, in, in life, there are some times where it's just flowing and everything's just perfect and it's all just going well and you know what's going on and what's gonna, what are you going to do next? And there are also periods of life where it's chaos and you just don't know what's going on and you don't know what's going to happen. There are periods of both in life. I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, can you accept that you're in one of those periods right now where you don't know what's going on? It's chaos. <laughs> can you just accept it's one of those periods? Can you be in that? And it really, really helped me to like consciously decide to be okay that I didn't know. And rather than make it, life is only okay when I know. Life is only okay when I can control how I want it. To accept, no, life isn't always like that. It's an immature position to take that I should always be in control and know what's going on or be trying to create it that way. How about being comfortable with it not being like that and seeing what that feels like and having a little bit of trust you know, kiss a few frogs. Um, they turn into princes, you know, princesses maybe. Yeah. So uh, to accept that life is life and light and dark, it's pleasure and pain, it's order yeah. and chaos. We're going to have to experience both. You can't always be like a child, only wanting the ice cream, but never the vegetables. Yeah, like one of my teacher always said, like it's not like white or black it's 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 not either or it's white and black in the same time 
you know it's yeah. like it's this the yin and yang it's all the it's always like so we need to hold those opposite in the same time and know that like you know this yeah. is it that like there is no you know, you know, with ramdas just now it's called becoming nobody it's on gaia mm -hmm. and amazon prime it's called becoming nobody he talks about this um he goes right now in the world there's a child being born to um a family waited there so long for this beautiful baby to arrive there's celebration and joy can you feel the joy yes do you feel joyful about that yes because at exactly the same moment right now there's a baby dying of starvation somewhere else which is tragic can you feel the grief of that yes well they're both happening right now at the same time can you be both with the joy and the grief at the same time and they both be true mm. Mm. yeah i have a yeah, question um, sorry on facebook we have a little question maybe can we mm. Great. let's have a question yeah a little comment sorry jamie isaac here um the question is actually what inspires you nowadays what is it that inspires you and actually why if there is such what inspires uh, people giving me compliments. <laughs> Jamie, you're great. <laughs> um, I'm inspired by um, slowing down and allowing myself more space rather than being busy creating, busy creating. Like I'm inspired by planting vegetables and watching them grow and how exciting it is when the sprout comes up through the earth or when you can pull it out the ground and eat it. You feel like... There's somebody put a meme on Facebook. It says, you know, great self-worth is not from making a million pounds. It's not for, it's from just growing a tomato. <laughs> you feel like incredible. Um, I feel really inspired by um, my group of teachers and my students, my disciples, no, my students. Um, I really feel inspired by people being vulnerable and brave and when i share my mess and my crazy and they share you share your mess and your crazy and not so superficially trying to always look nice on instagram and edit the photos so you always look beautiful people who have gone beyond that superficial shop window of themselves and are willing to show up in their mess and in their crazy and be authentic and intimate and visible with me that's the most inspiring thing in the world mm. It's very beautiful, by the way. Thank you. I'm so glad yeah. we recorded. <laughs> Isaac, any? <laughs> oh, no. Now you can see me. Yeah. How are you going? Um, uh, I'll be in the Isaac, back. do you have any other questions? Um, yeah. Uh, what, what was your question, Zach? Um, what is? What would you do to, in, in, to say to people or give advice to inspire people to work together more, to create more community? What is it uh, your sort of way or advice or maybe insight of getting people to be more collaborative and coming together, creating things together, maybe less in the concept of competition, for example? Yeah, I'm glad you say that. And I feel passionate that the way we're going to save the world or whatever, create positive change. Everyone, I get so many emails from people saying, I'm starting a new thing where we're going to bring together all these people and we're going to be the brand that unifies all the uh, eco, da, 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 or all the sustainable this or all the, but the problem is, is we are so brainwashed to be special that we want to be the thing. We're going to be the center that brings all the things together. We're going to be the thing that mentality of wanting to be special and be the thing is a problem. If we can all be happy to be a cog, which is a little small part of the machine, then all, there, are, there are enough people who are working for positive change to create a tipping point. But everybody wants to be the head of the spear. Everyone wants to be a bit special that their brand and their Instagram and their this and their that, so we have many different things which are not really connected. But if we could let go of the special addiction and be happy to be a cog and nobody have a lot of positive feedback about how special they are and nobody 
have you know like their brand is at the top if everybody could just be a cog and be happy to not be so recognized and not get the great positive feedback and act out all your mummy and daddy wounds through your project if we could all just be a bit smaller then all the cogs would fit together and the machine would give us the change that we wanted all of us is just little small parts so mm -hmm. my advice i guess is to let go of the specialness and think have cog mentality more how can i serve your thing not how can you lift up my thing it's obvious really but we're so addicted to specialness and being and getting all this positive feedback for our special offering that we have many many individual holes in the ground which never go very deep instead of one huge hole which could be an ocean of change yeah you're so special like everybody else huh yeah and and in in a way like when we were in tribe like when we were living you know in a tribal like each one if you look at the aboriginal in australia each person has his place you know like you, you know it's not like about one of them it's about like each one need to to have his place and, and then he know you know where his position so like yeah. Mm. yeah one more question and then i've got to go because i've got my uh my online gathering at 11 UK time and I need to uh, okay one more any question? other any other questions um yeah have you got any next project that you currently on the go or even thinking about due to what's going on something that you sort of yeah there's a few one I feel passionate about if anyone wants to give me a good budget is uh, is to heal the wound between the men and the women on the planet Beautiful. There have been a battle and a wound between the men and the women since the beginning of everything. The potential when we come together in love and in mutual service is incredible. But this unhealed wound and the terrible abuses that men have acted on the women and the violence and the control and the silencing, and there have been some the other way too, but it's not even, let's not pretend, even today. It is also mirrored in the rape of the planet and the, the masculine dragging, using planet for profit and dragging and taking without permission. The wound between the men and the women, particularly the male violence towards the women and control, is totally the same as, as the male violence towards Mother Earth. And I believe that we, there are many, many men right now who are awake and embracing their yin and emotions and their vulnerability and playing with their children and listening and learning but the male leadership needs to come back but we we can't skip the step of the healing that needs to happen of the like they had in south africa you know the truth and reparations the forgiveness the acknowledgement we can't skip that part and expect all the women to go oh come back we love you you we trust you no we have we have to go through a really dark place in the woods together and hold each other in this healing so I would like to make this movie, Adam and Eve, to reunite the men and the women so we can all step into our full potential together once and for all. Oh, so. beautiful. Yeah, my, my partner, Therese, is like <laughs> saying yes. <laughs> you, you'll send him the, the budget, right? Yeah, sure. Right. Thank yeah. you, guys. Thank you so much um, for one more question, just a quick, uh, if anyone want to follow you to uh, join your mm -hmm. workshops, or, or what is the best way to connect, to contact you through your Jamie website? JamieCatto.com or forwards, JamieCatto.com forward slash workshops. Okay. I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram, I'm always posting everything, I'm very lonely, uh, <laughs> very easy to find. Thank you so much for joining us, I uh, hope to have you... Um, in New Zealand one day, maybe mm, in our, in our uh, festival. I was there, they covered me. Ah, uh, nice one. Back. Cool. Okay, you have a good day. <laughs> Thank you. Bye.